We're very proud to introduce our special guest this evening. Most of you recognize him for his accomplishments on the football field. We'll also learn more about his ongoing achievements as a very successful entrepreneur and philanthropist. Anthony Munoz came to Cincinnati in 1980 as a first round draft pick of the Cincinnati Bengals, and he has made a big impact on our region ever since. As a player, you could say he excelled on the field. Anthony helped lead the Bengals to AFC championships in 1981 and 1988. He was selected to the Pro Bowl 11 years in a row, was named the NFL's Offensive Lineman of the Year three times, and was elected to the NFL Hall of Fame as soon as he was eligible. He was inducted in 1998. Even during his playing days, Anthony made a difference off the field. His commitment to leading by example, supporting local organizations, and giving back to the community led, Anthony, led to Anthony winning the Cincinnati Bengals Man of the Year Award five years in a row. He was also honored as the NFL Walter Payton Man of the Year in 1991. After, sure, why not? <laughs> After retiring, he turned his attention to starting the Anthony Munoz Foundation with the goal of having a positive impact on kids, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Since its inception in 2002, the foundation has raised more than $15 million and impacted over 55,000 children across our region. <laughs> Anthony is here tonight of course, because of his many successful business ventures. Along with serving as a spokesperson for a variety of area businesses, he launched Munoz Brands in 2004 to provide the latest innovative promotional products and corporate apparel. The company is based in the Blue Ash area and serves a wide range of customers with the largest markets in healthcare, hospitality, and higher education. Munoz Brands is built on the core principles of honesty, integrity, and excellence. It uses its size, experience, and diverse supply chain to consistently exceed customers' expectations with remarkable service and outstanding associates. We're delighted to hear more from Anthony tonight, so please join me in welcoming Anthony Munoz. Um, <clears throat> welcome. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me tonight. It's great to see you. Haven't been, it's been a while. It has been a while. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Anthony and I have spent some time together in the past. It's been so, I can't remember how many years, but I do remember one evening that he visited our house and his beautiful wife, Dee Dee, played the piano. The music in our house was just extraordinary. Um, not only is he a talented guy, but his family, his wife, son, and daughter are also very, very talented. And uh, what I want to ask you, though, about, oh, I do want to ask you one thing, besides the questions that maybe I sent you. You know, the only downside that I can see to Anthony's career is that he went to USC instead of OSU. Thank you. Well, let me just, <laughs> I did not want to go up and live in Corvallis and play at Oregon State University. Is that? Or no, OSU? no, no. <laughs> oh, Oklahoma State. No, uh, no, no. So, okay. So I'm not a genius, but I'm smart enough to know what part of the country I'm in. And I know that my daughter graduated from that school up in Columbus. But can just think if I would have gone to Ohio State, I wouldn't have won a Super Bowl or a Rose Bowl. <laughs> That's true. <Right? laughs> That's true. Even to this day, they're having trouble Instead winning Instead, I went game. to USC and I was three and zero oh in the Rose Bowl against two. Well, two of the team up north. I know you guys. Two against Michigan and one against Columbus. Oh, Ohio Michigan. State. Okay. But no, I let's let's keep on that subject. So, I grew up forty miles from the campus at USC. I grew up in Ontario, California, so forty miles. Um, as a, as a kid, 
I fell in love with USC. I don't know if it was because of the tradition, the school, or that big white horse that ran around the track every time the football <laughs> yeah. team scored. Yeah. But I always wanted to go there. So when they started recruiting me, now you have to understand, mom raised five by herself. I didn't have anyone to help me with the recruiting process. So I did it all alone. And as soon as USC came to my house, offered me a scholarship, come to school here, play football here, pretty much signed, sealed, and delivered. The only recruiting regret that I have is my senior year, Ohio State was coming out to California to play UCLA in the Rose Bowl. And I'll never forget, about two weeks before they came out, one of Woody Hayes' coach called me and said, as you know, we're coming out to play in the Rose Bowl. Woody would love to have lunch with you and talk to you about the Ohio State University. And I said, Coach, I said, I am flattered. I would, you know, that he would even consider talking to me, but I'm pretty much already made my decision to go to USC. And I played with several guys here with the Bengals that played for Woody Hayes. And of course, living in Ohio for 44 years as I have, to know about Woody Hayes, I wish I would have just taken the time to have lunch, have lunch with Woody Hayes. That's the only regret. But uh, I know Ohio State's a great school. And, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't trade going to USC for anything. What do you think about USC now in the Big Ten? Well, you know, it doesn't surprise me. Of course, I'm a traditionalist. I love the, the Pac-12 Big Ten Rose Bowl matchup. But as we all know, it's about money now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you're going to have the super conferences because of the money they're receiving. Uh, for me, it makes it better because now I can, you know, go to a game and it's going to be closer, but uh, not crazy about the start this year in the Big Ten. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm excited that they're, they'll be coming out this way to play. All right, let's talk a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Um, when you think about entrepreneurship, you know, you obviously had a huge career in professional sports, professional football. But transitioning from there into a sector that, you know, you probably didn't know a lot about, a lot of risk, what were some of the challenges Anthony, that you felt like you needed to deal with as you moved into a private sector role? Well, you're right. Very difficult. Uh, first of all, you know, I, I leave USC and I spent 13 years in the league. Some of my buddies who go into business right after we left USC, they have 13 years on me as far as their knowledge in the business. So for me to retire from the NFL at 35, still young, and then all of a sudden, okay, what do I do now? Uh, one of the things I did was broadcasting. So, yeah, that took a lot of my time. But, Kent, one of the things I did when I was playing, and, you know, when I got into the league, some of the guys still had to work in the offseason to supplement their income. Mm -hmm. But I was fortunate enough that I really didn't have to work in the offseason being the number three pick in the draft. But the way I thought, play um, one year, 10 years, 15 years in the NFL, I still needed to do something after I retired. So while I was playing, I did things in the off season to, to hopefully see if something I enjoyed doing. Not necessarily, this is what I'm going to do when I retire, but let's check it out. So I went to real estate school. I got my real estate license. I joined up with a broker and a builder, and we started a building company. Yeah. So I, I learned about the building. And, mm -hmm. and I'll say it, if I would have just focused now, knowing what I know, if I would have focused on the building part of it, I think I would have lasted longer. But um, So I learned about real estate. I learned about finances. I learned about, um, you know, a lot of things. And, and then I, while I was playing, my last seven years playing, I did high school football and radio to see if maybe broadcasting was something that I enjoyed. So I would prepare all week for the game on Sunday, and Friday night was, you know, Friday was usually a light day. So I would go, and, and we all know how great high school football is, not only in Cincinnati, but on the other side of the river. So I did that for seven years. Maybe that would lead to something after I retired. So I tried to really emerge myself into some of the things, even though I spent 12 months a year preparing for football. I was one of those guys that ran year-round, lifted year-round, did football technique year-round. So in my spare time of being a husband, a father, and an NFL player, I tried to do some other things. So, yeah, there was a lot of challenges when I decided to get into business. Uh, but so here's something that I would, would say to you. I played over 20 years of football and 13 years in the NFL. And what did I have every one of those years? I had an offensive line coach. I um, had guys that I learned from. 
and I rolled that over to when I became an entrepreneur and started a company, I wanted to surround myself with individuals that had a lot up here business-wise. Not only for business, Munoz Brands, and we had a, a marketing agency, but those that had been in the non-for-profit world, because I didn't start my foundation until eight years after I retired, and because when I was playing, I know the leverage and the relevance you have as a player to start a foundation, but like I mentioned, as an NFL football player, as a husband and as a father, I didn't have time to be engaged in a foundation. So surrounding yourself with mentors and um, letting your ego go, letting your pride go and be like a sponge because I, you know, like I said, I played 13 years in the NFL. So now it was time to learn business. So I surrounded myself with some amazing business people, P&G, people that own companies, financial advisors. Uh, and so that was my way of really getting into it and learning a lot about what I had to do and not shying away from it. A lot of times, if we don't know something, we have a tendency to shy away from it. And I, I can tell you that was my personality in a class like this. Time to answer a question, I would be a little hesitant. Even though I knew inside I had the answer, my confidence level wasn't to where I'd go, <laughs> I got the answer. <laughs> so when I started in business, I had to say, I don't know. Tell me, teach me. And that's what that's really what got me on the road to do what I'm doing now. And you can't be afraid to fail. Exactly. Failure is a way to actually learn and move on to the next step. And I'm sure in your life, in your career, whether it was football or whether it was business, you've had some <laughs> failures along the way. So how do you pick yourself up from that and move on to the next level? That's part of life. I mean, you know, I talked about mom raising five. I grew up in an environment where we had to pick ourselves up. When you have a mom that's working two, three jobs to provide, when you don't have a car, no transportation, I mean, you think, you do things, you're in survival mode. You got to pick yourself up constantly. Be successful, fail, get up and, and go back. And no different in football. I have not met a football player, present day, former Hall of Famer, that hasn't got knocked on your keister. I mean, it's, I'm right there. I, I can tell you, I got knocked over. How are you going to react to that? How are you going to react to getting knocked down in a sport or in life or in business? Are you just going to roll over or are you going to get back up and be that much tougher, that much better prepared, that tough, much tougher? And those are the things I learned, some amazing lessons that I learned from football that have carried over to life, carried over to business. And, uh, but yeah, you can't be afraid of failing. I mean, you know, I, I'm not, I'm going to share some things that, you know, I'm a big, and we talked about it earlier. I, I have not one ounce of musical talent. As Kim mentioned, my family, my wife sings, played the piano. My both kids played the piano. My son taught himself to play the guitar in college. I don't have, my gift is listening to music. So I love all these reality shows. You know, the voice, American Idol, of these people that get up in front of everybody and sing. I root for them, but I listen to the judges and they say it over and over and over. When they don't turn a chair or if somebody doesn't make it, come back because can you, you can't believe how many times we've been told no. You can't believe how many times I was laying on the ground and had to get back up. You can't believe how many times in business I lost that deal. But that is an incentive to come back, to bounce back and get after it even stronger. Prepare yourself even better. That's great advice. Um, Anthony, talk a little bit about your foundation mm -hmm. and the outreach your foundation has, not just in our greater Cincinnati area, mm -hmm. but, you know, outside of Ohio and, and really around the country, maybe even around the world. I'm not sure how far it really reaches, but tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> So as Bob mentioned, the foundation we, we established in 2002, I retired in 92. So it was a good 19 years after I retired. Uh, because like I said, when I do something, I want to be totally in. I want to be totally engaged. And I understood when I was playing that, uh, you know, you're playing, people know you, but I didn't have the time. So I waited and I put a game plan together. I put a mission statement. I started, okay, I want you to be part of the team. I started really recruiting team members. Uh, so in 2002, I started the foundation to engage the tri-state area to impact youth mentally, physically, and spiritually. And, and I think things that have helped me, not only the non-for-profit, 
I had a board member who had been a CEO in some big companies, and we sat down one time. He said, this is a non-for-profit, but you need to run it like a small business. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, um, that's great advice. Mm -hmm. You see, and, and one of the things we've done, not only with Munoz Brands have we restructured, have we changed the mission statement, but with our foundation. So we started the foundation with about four programs and then allocating funds to groups that I was working with it in the time when I didn't have the foundation. So I wanted to, to really impact young people the same way that the Ontario Parks and Recreation impacted me, my high school baseball coach impacted me, my economics teacher impacted me from high school, my science teacher who was not only a football coach but my biology teacher impacted me. I wanted to do that with the foundation. So, um, so I started to put the team together before I, we started the foundation, I had some CEOs, good friends of mine that would say, hey, mm -hmm. we need to do something together. And I would say, okay, we'll get there. We'll get there right time. So when I was ready, I went to them. I said, it's time now. So I put a board together. I put some uh, corporate uh, partners together. Now, 23 years later, it's amazing. I love it. I'm totally engaged. Uh, but also in the restructuring, we realized, I realized, okay, um, we're raising money and I'm giving it to your company. Why you as a company are going to give me money and then I'm going to give you money. Why don't you just give your money directly to this? So we said, okay, we got to, we got to redo our mission statement. So we eliminated allocating funds to other non for profits that I'd been working with and we decided to add a few more programs. So now if you're going to give money to us, we run our own programs and we roll up our sleeves. Everyone involved, we got four full-time staff. I'm there. We're going to roll up our sleeves and we're going to impact these young people in northern Kentucky, south, southern, uh, southeast Indiana, and the greater Cincinnati area. So now we have everything from mentoring to scholarships to overnight character camps. Uh, next week, we have 85 high schools that will, 1,100 students will have a leadership seminar where we bring in motivational leadership speakers. So we have eight programs that our staff is running. We put together, we run. So when you give your money, you know that 95 cents of the dollar is going to programs to impact these young people. And we're not, you know, we're cutting the fat. I mean, we're, we're paying our staff, but everything else goes towards, uh, you know, helping these young people. And we've been around 23 years. So the fun thing for me is traveling to New York uh, four years ago to do a show with my te former teammate, Boomer Esiason, in New York, but I fly in that afternoon and that night, right around the corner from the hotel I was staying in, Sam Becker, who is one of our scholarship kids, is working for a big hedge fund there, and I take him to dinner that night, and we talk about, hey, remember when you got the scholarship and now he's doing well in New York, and we were a small part of his education, or now we have young men that, as an eighth grader, were in our overnight character camps. Now they're bringing young men, and they're coaching these young men in our camps after they've graduated from college and now they're helping out. So, you know, when we talk about impact, we're, um, we're, like I said, we're right there rolling up our sleeves. We have eight programs. And I have to add this too, with the lean staff and as much as we do, cause we're working with about 2,500 to 3,000 kids a year and four full time staff asking a lot of them. So my thing for years is how do we take and have a deeper impact with our kids? Do we add more programs? Our staff's going, no, we don't have enough manpower. So one of the things we've done, we've reconnected with the a um, teenage, two teenagers that got married and they're all around the world in a ministry, but they've come back to Cincinnati and they established trauma competence care here in Cincinnati. Hmm. So we've implemented that program and trained our staff, our coaches, and a lot of educators are getting trained in trauma competence care so every event we have, we have staff there that are working with you because we've all experienced trauma. I mean, we can deny it, but we've all experienced some sort of trauma. And to have these tools to work with these young people, not only teaching them a little bit of football, <laughs> team building, character traits, but now we have this trauma competence care that we, can, we know how to communicate. We know what triggers these young men and women and things are going with in their home, in the community, in their schools. That's how we've taken our programs deeper. And I'll tell you what, I just turned 66 a couple months ago, and this still energizes me, and it still really motivates me to do what we're doing with the foundation. I think one thing that's important to, to point out what Anthony just said was 
<clears throat> when they first started the foundation, as part of being what is known as a 501c3, you have to donate money out of your foundation to another 501c3. You can't directly give money. Let's say if somebody was coming for a scholarship, an individual, it's very rare that you could actually give money to that individual directly because they're not part of a 501c3. So what he's done, he now created all these programs within his organization, his foundation, where he provides the programming. He doesn't have to give that money that's been raised to other 501c3s. Like he indicated, you know, you take it here. Okay, I got to give it over here to another another 501c3. Well, what impact are we really making there? So, you know, that's important to understand. And I think it's really amazing what they've been able to do, that transition. And that's part of being an entrepreneur, you know. You got to learn how to transition from one stage to another because it's a tough, tough road. It's not easy to do. But if you stick with it, you have perseverance, you've got the competitive spirit, which obviously we can hear that Anthony has that competitive spirit. He's always had that competitive spirit. Athletes tend to really be interesting to me because I read an article recently where there are a lot of athletes that really are entrepreneurs because they know the sacrifices that have to be made. They're passionate about what they do. And they're willing to, if they get knocked down, they're willing to get right back up again. Let's talk a little bit about, I think your foundation does a lot of wonderful things. Let's talk about some of your, the importance of branding though, you know, that you've developed with a lot of your products. Because branding and marketing and entrepreneurship are extremely important. Yeah. No, I, I've learned that. Um, um, while I was in the process of branding, I really didn't see it. But then after I retired, I realized I'd been building a brand for 13 years, the Anthony Munoz brand. Um, and a lot of hard work goes into branding. I um, mean, tremendous hard work goes into branding. Um, so while um, I was playing, not only on the field that I realized that was part of my brand, but who I was off the field that I can tell you on the field and off the field branding for 13 years has played a huge part in what I do in the non-for-profit and the business community. So it's not easy. I mean, none of us are above making mistakes. But I took my brand very, very serious, and I've been retired for 30 years now. And I can tell you the opportunities that I've received and um, I've had the opportunity to be a part of because of the brand that I've built, and Kent mentioned earlier, the number of companies that I've been able to represent. There's been companies that have come after me to represent, to promote their products, and they've said, we we're looking at two individuals and we decided to go with you because of who you are as a person. Again, none of us are above making mistakes, but I took that very seriously and I take it serious as I started the foundation and Munoz brands. There's times where I'll be in with my staff um, and we'll be looking at maybe doing a deal with the company and things aren't working the way they should be. They're not acting the way that we would like them to act, and I'll tell my staff, we don't need that deal. Um, it's a very lucrative deal. Good profit, a good, but they'll look at me, and now they understand what I mean when I say other deals will come our way to replace that. We don't need that relationship because we don't mesh in our values and in how we do business. Um, so branding is amazing. Like I said, I didn't realize at first for 13 years, I was establishing my brand and I, I decided and I wear it all the time. This is a brand. This is the Anthony Munoz Foundation brand right here. Very simple. But I think a lot of times I'm not assuming that everyone knows it. But when this is out in public, people, isn't that your foundation? A lot of stuff, a lot of times we'll put Anthony Munoz Foundation, the print, but most of the time it's just the A like this. Um, and then Munoz Brands, Brands with the Z. Um, so branding is very important. I, and I continue to share that with individuals 
And that's something that even at my age, I continue to work on my brand and, uh, and the, the opportunities I've been able to be involved with that are just amazing. Uh, and I got to share this one opportunity. I mean, I get some, I still pinch myself coming from where I came from. And I talked about, you know, we had nothing, but the opportunities that I get, um, and I've had, let me just kind of backtrack. So I retired. Our daughter was nine and our son was 11. So when I decided to announce I was retiring before the season, I took each one of them aside and I shared with them, dad's going to retire from the NFL. And Michael's response, 11 year old boy, Saturday was our time to take all the boys down to our practice facility and they would rearrange everything in the practice facility and they'd play tackle football with all, you know, all the little guys. And, uh, so his, he was said, I'm going to miss that. Uh, my daughter, he had one question. She goes, dad, will we be able to do the things that we're doing now that you're playing when you retire? Um, I got to take her to, I mean, Super Bowl. You know, awards banquets in Chicago and, you know, DC. We used to, I used to do a one on one with them. And I said, hopefully we will. Well, in the 30 years, we've done even more than I can imagine. So part of my brand has allowed me Friday afternoon to fly to Miami, spend the night in Miami Friday night, Saturday at noon to jump on the Norwegian Joy, set sail Saturday with the a Fortune 500 company, Sunday morning, wake up and speak at their national prayer breakfast, sail the rest of the day, and then fly home Monday from Nassau, Bahamas. And to me, that's happening because of the brand. Because of the brand that I continue to work on, I get those opportunities to go out and to share. And I love speaking. I love talking about certain things. Uh, I can tell you I love talking about football. I love talking about non-for-profits. I love talking about you know, sports. But one of the things I love talking about is faith. And, uh, and this is an opportunity at Fortune 500 Club to go talk about my faith. So, uh, those are the type of things that when you build your brand and you stick um, to your guns, stick to your core values with your brand, it, I, I really believe it pays off. Absolutely right. Let's give Mr. Munoz a round of applause for being here with us tonight.